Hello, thank you for joining us on our series on Catholic Women. I'm Jenny Zayner, and today we'll be talking about St. Joan of Arc, who is the patroness of France and of soldiers. St. Joan of Arc was born in the little village of Champagne in France. Priests and former playmates, amongst others, recall her for her love of prayer and the church her frequent reception of the sacraments, her care of the sick, and her sympathy with poor wayfarers to whom she often gave up her own bed. A happy childhood was hers, though clouded by the disasters of her country as well as the dangers of attack to which a frontier town like hers was especially exposed. She had been but a very young child when King Henry V of England invaded France, overran Normandy, and claimed the crown of the insane King Charles VI. St. Joan was in her 14th year when she experienced the earlier of her, earliest of her supernatural manifestations, which led her through her path of patriotism to death on the stake. At first, it was only a single voice addressing her apparently from nearby and accompanied by a blaze of light. Afterwards, as the voices increased in number, she was able to see her interlocutors, who she, whom she identified as St. Michael the Archangel, St. Catherine, St. Margaret, and others. Only very gradually did they unfold her mission. She, a simple peasant girl, was to save France. By May 1428, they had become insistent and explicit on her mission. She must present herself at once to Robert, who commanded the king's forces in the neighboring town. But Robert only laughed and dismissed her. After Joan's return to her town, her voices gave her no rest. When she protested that she was only a poor girl who could neither ride nor fight, they replied, it is God who commands it. Unable to resist such a call, she secretly left home and went back to the town. Robert's skepticism at her mission was somewhat shaken when, officials conf when official confirmation reached him as of a serious defeat of the French, which Joan had previously predicted to him. He now not only consented to send her to the king, but he gave her an escort of three men at arms. At her own request, she traveled in male dress to protect herself. Although the little party reached Chinan, where the king was residing, on March 6, 1429, it was not till two days later that Joan was admitted to his presence. Charles had purposely disguised himself, but she identified him at once, and by a secret sign communicated to her by her voices and imparted by, him, by her to him alone, she obliged him to believe in the supernatural nature of her mission. She then asked him for soldiers whom she might lead to the relief of Orleans. Accordingly, her return to Chinon arrangements were pushed forward to equip her to lead the force. A special standard was made for her bearing the words, Jesus, Maria, together with a representation of the Eternal Father to whom two kneeling angels were presenting a fleur de lis. On April 27th, the army left with Joan at its head, clad in white armor, and entered Orleans on April 29th. Her presence in the beleaguered city brought marvels. On May 8th, the English forts were surrounded, Orleans had been captured, and a siege raised. The maid was then allowed to undertake a short campaign. It was completely successful and ended with a victory in which English for forces suffered a crushing defeat. On July 17th, Charles VII was solemnly crowned, Joan standing at his side with her standard. That event, which completed the mission originally entrusted to Joan by her voices, marked also the close of her military successes. Upon the resumption of hostilities, she hurried to the relief of Champagne, which was holding out against the Burgundians. 
She entered the city at sunrise on May 23rd, and that same day led an unsuccessful battle. Through panic or some miscalculation on the part of the governor, the drawbridge over which her company was retiring was raised too soon, leaving Joan and some of her men outside at the mercy of the enemy. She was dragged from her horse and led to the quarters of John of Luxembourg. From that time until late autumn, she remained the prisoner of the Duke of Burgundy. On February 21st, 1431, she appeared for the first time before a tribunal presided over by the bishop, an unscrupulous man who hoped through English influence to become archbishop. The prisoner was examined and cross-examined as to her visions and her voices, her assumption of male attire, her faith and her willingness to submit to the church. Alone and undefended, she bore herself fearlessly. Her shrewd answers and accurate memory, astonishing and frequently embarrassing her questioners. In a final deliberation, the tribunal decided that she must be handed over to the secular arm as a heretic if she refused to retract her beliefs. This she declined to do, though threatened with torture. Once again, she declared that God had truly sent her and that her voices came from God. On May 30th, 1431, Joan was led out into the marketplace to be burned at the stake. Joan's demeanor on that occasion was such as to move even the most hardened to tears. When the fires were lighted, a Dominican friar at her request held up a cross before her eyes. And as the flames leapt up, she was heard to call upon the name of Jesus before surrendering her soul to God. She was not yet 20 years old when she died. After her death, her ashes were cast into the sign. 33 years later, Joan's mother and her two brothers appealed for a reopening of the case, and the Pope appointed a commission for the purpose. Its labors resulted. On July 7, 1456, in the quashing of the trial and verdict and the complete rehabilitation of the Maid of Orleans, over 450 years later, on May 16, 1920, she was canonized with all the solemnity of the church. Thank you for joining us.